the faces of each and every person. We trust tonight that you have a Bible in hand or at least uh, look at the screen as much as we are able to put the scriptures there for your consideration tonight. We believe that the Bible is right. We ought to speak what the Bible speaks and be silent for the Bible is silent. To call Bible things by Bible names and to do Bible things in Bible ways. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having they are conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God had created to be received with thanksgiving. Tonight we like to speak on the subject, the restoration of New Testament Christianity the restoration of New Testament Christianity. The word restore means to renew to the original quality. It is to bring back to one's former state. Christianity has suffered deterioration over the years. It doesn't look like it did 2,000 years ago. When the apostles were alive and the early Christians, they were a part of a Christianity that doesn't look like what we see today. And thus, the Apostle Paul warned that there would be a departure from the faith. The Spirit spoke very clearly, very expressly, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. There will be those who will leave original New Testament Christianity. There is one faith, and they would depart from that faith. Not only that, the Bible says that they will give heed to seducing spirits. There will be those who will speak in such a seducing way to draw people away from the faith from original New Testament Christianity. They will also teach doctrines of devils. Doctrines that originate not from the word of God, but from Satan himself. Satan has always presented doctrines contrary to truth. Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, If ye shall continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so then there are those who will seduce people away from the faith. Not only that, they will come up with all kinds 
of doctrines, whether it be doctrines about salvation, faith only, grace only, sinner's prayer, mourner's bench, call on Jesus fast as you can, flip over chairs, roll on the floor, all kinds of doctrines of devils that have no origin in the faith. And then the Bible says that some will speak lies in hypocrisy. To lie is to deceive. Some folk lie unintentionally. They perpetuate something that was told them that's not true. Others intentionally mislead. These will speak lies in hypocrisy. They will give the impression that they are part of Christianity when they are speaking against it, telling lies all the time. Satan is a master at telling lies. He told a lie to Eve. God said, thou shalt die. But I say, thou shalt not surely die. Jesus said in John 8, 44, ye are of your father the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus told those Jews, I know who your daddy is. You're not Abraham. Your daddy is a devil because he's a liar. And when people speak lies in religion, those lies are in hypocrisy. And they draw people away from the faith, from original New Testament Christianity. Forbidden to marry, back in 1 Timothy 4, forbidden to marry. These are people who have a legitimate scriptural right to marry, but religion says you can't marry. Priests and, and those who preach are told in some religions you can marry. And what's the outcome of that? Well, they flew with the nuns, with the boys, altar boys, and everything else, and homosexuality. Why? God said back in Genesis 2.18, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help, meet for him. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. Let every woman have her own husband. Not only that, we find that Paul father warned in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. He had called the Ephesian elders to him at Miletus. And he warned them of dangers facing original New Testament Christianity. He said in Acts 20 and 28, Take ye therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he had purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Of your own selves also shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples out of them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The apostle Paul warned that apostasy would begin in the, in the leadership among the elders of the church, that there will be men who will arise and they will want to draw away the disciples out of them. And they would be like wolves in sheep clothing, misleading and misguiding and usurping authority and causing problems from the inside out. Men in positions of leadership. And that's why Jesus warned 
in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. It is all right to be fruit inspectors, to check out, to examine, to scrutinize, to verify, to validate everything taught by every person that claims to speak for God. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. How much should be proven? Not some, not most. Everything religiously must be proven, checked out, scrutinized, analyzed, verified, and only hold on to that which passes the test. In 1 John 4 and 1, 1 John 4 and 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Just because one mount or rostrum doesn't mean we ought to close our Bibles, fold our arms, and say he must be preaching truth. He must be checked out, verified, scrutinized, and make sure that he's only speaking the word of God. And so it is imperative that we as people check out every person who speaks. The truth is not intimidated by investigation. You can check it out and it will prove itself to be right every single time. Now then, when we look at restoration of New Testament Christianity, the Bible condemns religious division. Even in the first century, when it appeared, it was condemned. It was exposed. And warnings were given. Beware of division. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through about 13. The Apostle Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that you be perfectly joined, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions or divisions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you said, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so here we are warned that we are to all speak the same thing. Everybody can speak the same thing if everybody has the same standard. We can understand that. If we want to know uh, the, 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 length, the length of this, the, this stage, we can all guess on it and all be wrong. But if we get a tape measure... And, and authorize, accept the standard of measurement, whatever it says, we get rid of our opinions. If I look at it, oh, I think that's about 10 feet. If it come up 11 feet, I give up 10 feet. If somebody said 9 feet, give up 9 feet. 9 feet, 10 inches, give it up. Whatever the measurement tape says, that's not almost it. That's it. And we can understand that in that. Why can't we can understand that when it comes to the Bible, when it comes to religion. Because the Bible is God's authorized standard to determine right and wrong religiously. Now then, in order for us to restore New Testament Christianity, we got to go back to the fountainhead. We got to go back to the beginning. We got to go back to the source. I looked on a map at the hotel this evening on my uh, phone, and I found a river. Now, I don't know what I'm talking about outside of what I saw on the map. You can correct me if I'm wrong because you live here. 
I found a river called the Dan River. Never heard of Dan River before. But if you live around here, you probably know about the Dan River. So I chased that river on that map downstream, and it went down to a lake. I traced it upstream, and it went to the mountain. That, that sound right? Well, most rivers that start in the mountains are very clean and, and, and clear. And you can drink right from the spring that come out of the mountain. But once it goes downstream, it picks up all of the suck and all of the pollution and all of the stuff folk dump in there. And you don't want to drink it when they get way down here uh, in Eden. Uh, you might eat a fish out of it, but you don't go down there and drink out of it because it's contaminated. Religion has become contaminated. Everybody has mixed in stuff that you don't find in the Bible, and to restore New Testament Christianity, we got to go back to the mountain, go back to the fountainhead, go back to the source of New Testament Christianity. Now, when I use the word New Testament, the New Testament is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. The Bible has two major testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament has many covenants, but there are two major covenants. There's the patriarchal dispensation that started from creation. And it consists of people like Adam, Noah, and they are called patriarchs. And then, of course, God spoke to those fathers through the prophets. By the time of Moses, God has selected a people, and he gives them a law called the Mosaic Law, sometimes called the Ten Commandments, sometimes called uh, just the law. And that law regulated the children of Israel for about 1,500 years. And thus we find that that Mosaic law existed until the time that Christ came and he died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, then it ended the Mosaic law and it also ended the patriarchal dispensation in force. And thus everybody, Jew and Gentile, after Christ died on the cross, was buried and rose again, the New Testament on Pentecost was enacted. And everybody since Pentecost is regulated by the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. It's kind of like, let's say that in the year 2010, I wrote a will, and so I gave my son a, uh, a truck. And in 2013, I write a new will, the last will. And instead of giving him the truck, I give him a Mercedes. And when I die, which will will go into effect? Well, the last will and testament. And that last will will nullify all previous will. And all my possessions will be distributed according to the last will and testament. Well, Jesus gave the last will and testament. And it nullifies and ended all previous wills. So we don't worship today offering calves and bulls and goats for sacrifices. We don't offer them at the altar. We don't celebrate uh, uh, Passover and uh, Pentecost and tabernacles. We don't burn incense. All of that was under the Mosaic Law. Under the New Testament, we go from Matthew to Revelation. We're regulated by that. Now, in Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse 14 through 17, the Bible makes that clear. Hebrews 9, 14 through 17. 
How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offer himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? For he, for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For a testament or a will is of, uh, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death. Of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. And so a will is probated and is enforced after men die. When Jesus died on the cross, then his will was probated. Every person since Pentecost must obey Jesus to get salvation in order to enjoy the blessings of God. That's the law on which we live. That's the New Testament. Christianity is a part of New Testament. And thus, we need to restore New Testament Christianity. Now then, the word Christianity is the teaching of Jesus Christ about salvation from sin. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, the Apostle Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. And so here we find that the gospel plan of salvation that makes one a Christian involves the fundamental facts that Jesus died for our sins. That he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Not only that, we need to recognize uh, that when one obeys the gospel, he becomes a part of a community called the saved. Paul said in Romans 1, 14 through 16. Romans 1, 14 through 16. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What are those verses teaching? God has invested all of his saving power in the gospel. He has chosen to save men through the gospel. The gospel, therefore, is God's universal message that all men must obey to obtain salvation. Jesus put it this way in Mark 16, 15 and 16. Go ye therefore into all the world that's everywhere and preach the gospel to every creature that's every person. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. What is in Jesus? There's one message for the whole human race. Doesn't matter whether you're black or white, red or yellow, polka dot or green. There's one message for everybody. Doesn't matter whether you're in America, in Africa, in Asia, in South America. Doesn't matter where you are. There's one message for everybody, everywhere. And everybody got to obey it the same way. You got to believe. 
You must be baptized to be saved. If you don't do it that way, you'll be damned. If you decide not to believe, then you'll be damned. You decide not to be baptized, you'll be damned. Why? Belief and baptism are joined by the word and. A coordinated conjunction that make them of equal significance, you must do both. You must believe and be baptized to be saved. Example. Let's say, I don't know what it is that for this from here, but I'm going to say back home. Let's say if I go to Columbia, South Carolina, and I want to fly from Columbia to New York. I got to buy a ticket. I got to board the plane to fly to New York. Now, if I don't buy a ticket, can I board the plane? You can't get past security. You got to show up a ticket to get past security. So guess what? I won't fly to New York. If I buy a ticket, but I go to sleep in, uh, in the airport and don't get on the plane, I'm not going to end up in New York. I got to buy the ticket. I must board the plane to fly to New York. One must believe and be baptized to be saved. And you come with all kinds of hypotheticals. Well, I went to sleep. I went to the bathroom. Uh, I'm, I'm in the wrong terminal. You still missed the plane. You're not flying to New York. You can't just. <laughs> you got to board the plane. Now, oh, we can understand that. Well, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. I'm not one of many ways. I'm not the best of many ways. I'm the only way. You can't get to the, to the Father. You can't get to heaven in a way. And that tells you and I that whatever Jesus says is not almost it. That's it. If we want to go to heaven. Now, if we don't want to go to heaven, we can just do what we want to do. But if we want to go to heaven, we got to follow Jesus. Now then, Christianity therefore says that I got to believe in the gospel. I must be baptized in order to be saved. And let me tell you something. There's only one gospel. There's not many gospels that will save. There's only one saving gospel. In Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Galatians 1. 6 to 9. Brother Hewlin, you got that? I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I marvel. I'm shocked. I'm astonished how quickly somebody hoodwinked you to leave the gospel for another gospel. Read. Which is not another. There's not another one like this one. Read. But there be some that trouble you. Some will have you confused, will mix you up, will mess you up, have you thinking there's another gospel. Read. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. What they would do is change, alter, pervert, modify, and some kind of way hoodwink you with something other. They will pull a switch about. Read. But though we or an angel from heaven. I don't care if it's an apostle. I don't care if an angel fly through heaven and come down here and tell you something else. Read. Preach any other gospel If he unto preaches you, another gospel, what is he? Then that which we have preached unto you. Read. Let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. He's made his last trip between heaven and earth. He's accursed. I don't care any man, any person, if an angel, if you're dreaming and dream a dream and the dream says, you know what? Stand in your head for 30 minutes, you go to heaven. Wipe it off. That was a bad. That, that wasn't a bad dream. That's a nightmare. <laughs> All right. Why? It's a lie. No matter who says it, how it comes, there's not another one like this one. Read. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. When God says something one time, that's enough. When he says something two times. Who would dare tamper with it? Those who preach it and those who obey it are cursed. 
You don't want to be a curse. That means you can't go to heaven. There's a place for people who want to change and will change the gospel. That place called hell. Why? Because they are too stubborn and they are they're, they're, they're too mean. They are too self-willed to do it God's way. If Jesus would die for us, shed his blood, provide for our salvation, who would tamper with this gospel? That's why you check out what's taught. You scrutinize it. You analyze it. You verify it because our souls lie in the balance. Now then, when I talk about original New Testament Christianity, Christianity is universal. It was set up by Jesus Christ because he's Lord. Nobody else qualifies to establish a way to get to heaven. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, listen to Jesus. Jesus says, all power, rather, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all power, there it is, is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That's everywhere. He has not some power, not most power. He has all authority. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe, listen, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. What is in Jesus? As the Son of God, as the one who never sinned, as the one who came down from heaven and put on a body and tabernacled among men, as the Son of God, Jesus has all authority in religion. That means whatever we do, whatever we teach, must be authorized by the Son of God. And it must stay that way until the world comes to an end. And since the world is still standing, nobody else has any right to add to the Word of God, to take away from the Word of God, to tamper with it in any form or fashion. So the way he set up Christianity is how it needs to stay. And if we deviate from it, we have departed from the faith. And if we were seduced to do it, or we were taught doctrines of devils, or we were told lies and hypocrisy, we need to back up and get out of it quick and in a hurry. Not only that, we need to recognize that when we speak about New Testament Christianity, that everybody obeyed the same thing. There was not a multiplicity of plans of salvation. In Ephesians chapter 4, and verses 3 through 6. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Even as you are called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God. And Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. What is he saying? We must endeavor. We must strive. We must work hard to maintain the unity. To maintain the oneness of Christianity, which involves one faith. What is one? Less than two, more than zero. Again, less than two, more than zero. How many faiths are there? There's one faith. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. You ask folks today, what faith are you? Methodist faith, Baptist faith, uh, Catholic faith, Presbyterian faith, Joe Witness faith, this faith, that faith, his faith, her faith, my faith, that faith, our faith, one faith. One faith. Everybody, everywhere, ought to be believing the same thing. One Bible. One gospel. Why folk mixed up in different faiths? It's kind of like a recipe. 
Let's say I have a recipe for a cake. And on that sheet, it says two cups of sugar. Somebody said, well, I feel like I can use something else. But they get two cups of salt. Then they look on there and say, two cups of flour. Well, I got some grits. They put in there two cups of grits. They say, well, two cups of milk. They put two cups of orange juice. Six eggs. They put in there, they're going to get six muscadines. And they put it in a blender and mix it up and throw it in the oven and they come out with a mess that nobody can eat. Why? They did not follow direction. God has given us direction. Don't add to it. There's only one faith. There's one recipe. And if you add to the recipe, take away from it, add sugar, or rather add salt, take away sugar, you're going to mess up the cake. Even if you did everything else right, putting salt in there will, will mess up the cake. Even if it's not two cups. You, you, if you leave the sugar out and put a half a cup of salt in there, throw it out. Now we understand that. That makes all the sense in the world. But folk will look at the Bible and say, I don't believe you got to be baptized. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, if you can see through the Bible, you can see, you can see that. In Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Well, I don't have to be baptized. Suppose this happened. Suppose that happened. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. That's everybody. In the name of Jesus Christ, by his authority. Why? To have your sins remiss. To have your sins washed away. Before I left home uh, Saturday, I was washing some clothes. And I ran the water, I put the clothes in there, ran the water, but I didn't push the start button. Because I had to put some mess in there. I had to put some detergent in there. And I got two little, they had, they had some lines on the cup, and I poured up to two lines of Tide. And I pulled it into the little place in the dispenser, closed it up, and I pushed the start button. You know what that, you know what that washing machine did? It got the stains out of the clothes. It washed the clothes, cleaned the clothes, pressured the clothes. Why? Because I put the water in, I put the tide in, and the stains came out. When one repents, when one confesses Christ, and he's buried in that watery grave. He contacts the cleaning agent, the blood of Christ, that washes his sins away. It's not the water that washes sins away. It's the blood. But the blood cleanses sins when you're baptized. That's the time. That's when your sins are washed away. The what is the blood. The when is when you go in the water. So you go out there uh, in the backfield, uh, looking up in the sky and all that. God is not in the dry cleaning business. You can't be dry clean. You got to get wet. In John 3.23, John was baptizing in Anum, near Salem, because there was much water there. There's not enough water in this bottle. To baptize anybody in here. I was a Methodist. I was sprinkled as a baby. I was sprinkled at 12. And when I got 18, I started reading the Bible for myself and couldn't find sprinkling. So I went back to him and said, why was I sprinkled? Well, that's, what, that's, that's our tradition. But if you don't like sprinkling, we'll go back and immerse you. We'll sprinkle you, pour you, or immerse. I said, well, two of them got in the Bible. I couldn't find them. I, out the door, I had to go. Why? Because the Bible is right. And it's our guide and our pattern. And nobody should be teaching or practicing something you can't find in the Bible religiously. 
Not only that, everybody not only obeyed the one faith, but they also submitted to the one baptism. Back in Ephesians 4, in verse number 5, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. That one baptism is in the water. It's for remission of sins. It's when our sins are washed away. We're added to the church. And then there's one body, verse 4. One body. How many is one? Less than two. More than zero. Now men can come up with counterfeits, with imit imitations, but Jesus established the church. In Matthew 16 and verse 13 beginning, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Is the psalm say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets? Say unto his disciples, Whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What are you saying, Jesus? I, not Peter. I, not Moses. I, not John the Baptist. Not Boniface III. Not Charles or uh, 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 John uh, 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 Wesley. Not uh, Tad T. Russell, not Mary Baker Eddy. Jesus, I will be my church. That my is a possessive pronoun, showing ownership. It belongs to Jesus. And like a woman said, my kitchen. You understand that? My money. You understand that? Go get my pocketbook. <laughs> Jesus said, I will be my church. Singular. That's New Testament Christianity. Now you look around here today, you see thousands of churches with different names, different doctrines, different practices, different organizations, and all of them are not in the Bible. Thought it too late for the press. The church Jesus built was established the same year he died, he was buried, and he rose. 33 A.D nearly 2,000 years ago. Anything after that, it was too late for the press. The Bible was signed, sealed, and delivered by the year 100. Revelation had been completed. It's like the newspaper. They said, you want an article in the Sunday paper, have it in Friday at 12 o'clock. You show up Saturday at 5.30. Too late for the press. The only church in the Bible is the one that Jesus built because it's the only one in the world when the Bible was written. Everything else is too late for the press. So you got to go to history book to find it. You can't go to the Bible. In Romans 16, 16, salute one another with the holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. I had to bring a clock up here. I don't know what time it is. How long have I been? What time is it? <laughs> Just preach, okay. I won't be long. I want you to come back tomorrow. Now then, all who obey Jesus were called Christians. Not Muslims, not Methodists, not Baptists. They were all called Christians. Why? In Acts eleven twenty six. A Gentile church had been established in the city of Antioch. And disciples were multiplying in that congregation. Barnabas had left Antioch to go to Tarsus and to seek for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. If you're a follower of Christ or a disciple of Christ, the only name the Bible recognizes is a Christian. In the first century, 
Everybody wore the same name. Christian. In 1 Peter 4, 15 and 16. 1 Peter 4, 15 and 16. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. But if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in this behalf. If you suffer wearing that name because you're a Christian, don't be ashamed. We ought not be ashamed to just be a Christian. I don't want to be called by any other title but a Christian religiously. Not a black Christian, not a this, that, or other kind, no hyphenated Christian. If you're in Christ, you're a Christian. And that's all you need to be called. And then also, a group of Christians in one locality is called the church. The church. In the first century, they didn't have to say which church because there was only one church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will be a my church. And whenever saints met in a locality, they were called the church. In Acts 14, 23, they had established many churches. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Every church, every congregation is to have its own leadership, its own organization, having elders as overseers of the church. Every congregation. Not only that, the Bible makes it clear in verse number 27 of the same uh, chapter, Acts 14, and verse number 27, the Bible says, And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. The church is not a building. The church is not made of brick, wood, or model. The church because it's a people who can come together because they have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can meet on a shade tree and be the church. Under this tent and be the church. It's all right to have a building, but a building don't make it a church. Church consists of people. People called out of the world into the body of Christ. Baptized believers. That's what the church is. The original church, every person that obeyed the gospel, the Lord put them in his church. In Acts 2, 47, on the day of Pentecost, when the church was established, the Bible says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Everybody, the Lord saves, he put them in a certain place. In the church. Which church? The one he built. The one he's head of. The one he's married to. The one that he died for. So who adds? The Lord added them to the church. Not the churches. To the church. The one that he built. The one that he bought. The one he's the head of. The one he's married to. The one that wears his name, the church of Christ. In 2 John 9-11, we are warned about ever departing from original New Testament Christianity. 2 John 9-11, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. That abided in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If thou come in after you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither be him God speed. The only doctrine that men should receive is what God has delivered the doctrine of Christ. And if you receive one and embrace that doctrine, you become a partaker of his evil deed. 
He that bid him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deed. It is evil to go outside the doctrine of Christ. If Christ didn't teach it, you can't embrace it and be pleasing to the God of heaven. As we close tonight, I want to ask you a few questions. Number one, are you willing to go all the way back to the source, to original New Testament Christianity, free from the impurities, free from the corruption of man-made religion, and go back to that which was established by the Lord Jesus Christ, that which you can find upon the pages of inspiration. Jesus said again in John 8, 31 and 32, if you shall continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Are you willing to accept the truth tonight and be made free from sin? Are you willing to recognize Jesus as the only source of salvation and his gospel as the only plan that can save man? Any alterations in it will cause one to be a curse. Not only those who teach it, but also those who obey it. Well, you know, I, I, I don't believe all that they're teaching, but, you know, I just go along with it. You'll be a curse. Because you can't tamper with the doctrine of Christ. And then finally tonight, are you willing to drink from the fountain here? And become a part of the church that strives to remain pure and true to the New Testament pattern. We don't look at which way the wind blows and go with the crowd when it comes to the worship. We'll talk about that maybe tomorrow night some. Uh, we're not going to bring pianos here because everybody got them. We can give them like everybody else. A dollar down, a dollar a week. It ain't about a matter of cost. There's no Bible for it. When it comes to the Lord's Supper, first day of the week, 52 times a year, 52 times a year. Why? Because of the Bible teaches. Are you willing to let the Bible be your sole guide? Go back to the fountainhead, be a part of the church that the apostles were a member of, the other church, the one that's in the Bible you hold in your hands. Because Jesus says this, and John 12 and 48. Listen to it. He that rejects me and receiveth not my words has one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. This won't be the last time we hear this message. The question is, if we reject it, we're rejecting Jesus. And at the last day, he reject us. But because of who he is and what he's done for us, we don't want to reject him nor his gospel. We want to obey it. And tonight, you have the opportunity to come to Jesus. He says in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, Come unto me, all you that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If you are shackled in sin, and all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, Jesus says, come. Come to me on my terms, on my condition. Learn of me. Learn my gospel. Learn my plan of salvation. And then come. You'll find rest to your soul. I'll take your burden of sin off you and I'll carry it for you. I will lift you up. I will remove your sins. I will wash them away. I'll make you new. And I'll put you into the place of shelter. That when the storms of life are raging, then I'll be there by your side. He says, listen. I want you to, to recognize you'll find rest unto your soul. 
peace in this life and then knowing that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that you have a reservation in heaven. Why? Because you obey his word. And he said, listen, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. If you yoke up with Jesus, your task, your struggles in life become so much easier. You're not carrying them by yourself. He said, I'll be with you. I never leave you nor forsake you. But you got to come. Come believe it. Believe that he is the Christ. He's the son of God. He said in John 8, 24, if you believe not that I'm he, you'll die in your sins. Not only must we believe, we must repent. Repentance means I must change. Stop doing what's wrong and do what's right. Make up in my mind, I'm going to stop fighting. I'm going to stop kicking. I'm going to stop arguing. I'm going to stop uh, just getting all mad. And say, well, I don't, don't want to hear it. I got to find out I'm wrong. The Bible is right. I got to give. I got to yield. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. And when I do that, I confess him as the son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Peter made that confession. You and I must make it as well. You can make that confession tonight. And then be baptized in water, whereby God will wash your sins away. Add you to the church that Jesus built and remain faithful, serving him unto death and heaven to be your home. If we can assist you tonight, if you haven't been baptized, we're inviting you to come to Jesus. You're not coming to me. You're not coming to any of these brethren here. You're coming to Jesus. To be a part of his church. So when he returns, he'll call you by name and take you back to heaven with him. If you're in Christ and you haven't been faithful, you backslidden, you become slack and slothful, you need to repent. Ask for the prayers of the saints and determine to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't ever quit. Don't ever back up. Don't throw in the towel. You've got to work out your salvation with the trembling. Not to earn your salvation, but to stay on the safe side. Stay on the Lord's team. And you got to be faithful. If we can assist you in either way tonight, have the courage to step up and step out, to come forward, and to make tonight the night that you surrender all to Jesus. If we can assist you, come right now while we stand and sing. Brother Sapp, for the fantastic lesson, we are very excited about the concept of giving everybody in this area an opportunity to go back to original Christianity. Tonight, we have visitors with us, and we are very, very concerned about your reception of this lesson. And one of the ways that we try to convince people of our assurance and confidence in a lesson is two things. One, we allow people to ask questions about the lesson maybe try to find out things that you were not uh, sure about or clear about. And then number two, tomorrow night, if you, let's say you had some questions tonight and you're not sure that your Bible knowledge is adequate to know whether or not you have heard the truth for sure or not because it sounds different than what you've heard, we allow you to bring your pastor and we will allow him to ask questions and or speak tomorrow night. Now see, that's a, that's a great difference, wouldn't you say? Now, the reason why we do that is because we recognize that today, just like in the apostles' days, when you ask you, if you would, Micah, to look at Titus chapter 1 and verse 9. In the apostles' days, if you notice here, the Bible says that they were to hold fast faithful word as he had been taught that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. Now, watch this. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. In Paul's day, there were a lot of individuals, just like Brother Melvin showed in the beginning, that were vain talkers and deceivers. And what did he tell this man to do in verse 5? Titus was told in verse 5, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldst set us order, set things in order. You know that's what we're trying to do in Eden? Just like in Crete, there were many vain talkers and deceivers. They loved filthy lucre or money. 
And as a result of that, they go off into false doctrine. And somebody has to set things in order. I know Brother Sapp did not think, say, say when he left uh, South Carolina, I'm just looking forward to come down there and just straighten those folks out. It's not, a, it's not a happy job that we have when we realize that people need to be set in order, but it's a job that we have to do in order that we might hold fast sound doctrine. And so we appreciate the lesson, and we want you to know that's what we're trying to do. We realize that there are problems in the first century church uh, in those days, and there are going to be problems today, and there's always got to be somebody who's willing to set things in order. And Brother Sapp, you did a fantastic job doing that. Now, tonight, we have another treat, and that is that Brother James and uh, uh, Brother Fulton, they have gone to the television station. We can all go back to our respective homes and uh, hotel rooms and turn on Channel 5, and we'll get to see those two brothers setting in order things that we have uncovered while we've been door knocking in the last two weeks. And so I believe it'll be a fantastic broadcast, and uh, we'll all... Uh, be able to watch that and, and want to, uh, men to know that you can call in if something is said or you uh, see something that you want to make a, a comment in, on. The phone lines will be opened up and we'll be able to make comments on that. So I'm not going to hold you very long. I know we all want to make sure that we get to see the broadcast. We're going to ask now before we say our closing prayer, anybody have a question? And if you do, we're going to say our closing prayer and then we'll answer those questions and persons who need to leave, we'll, let, we'll allow you to leave. Anybody got a question tonight that they need to ask uh, before we leave? And we want you to know you don't have to ask your question publicly. We'll allow you to ask questions. Uh, Brother Sapp still be here. These men that are in the uh, uh, preaching school there, our men that are uh, involved in preaching this area, will all be available to answer any questions anybody has. It looks like we don't have any questions tonight. Brother Joey, you want to leave us in another, in a closing song? We've had a fantastic night of, of hearing God's word. Great opportunity to be edified in song and to uh, encourage one another. And we'll have one more song, and we'll ask Brother Eugene Edwards if he would come and lead us in our closing prayer. <laughs>